This is an installation in the, a series, Do You Love the Truth? that I want to bring, not necessarily in consecutive order, but anyway, there will be others. Do You Love the Truth? And the first of these We'll look at a couple of the episodes in Daniel regarding, well, the man Daniel and also the other men, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, as we ask the question, do you love the truth? Now, in these, uh, it is my intent to approach this topically, that we're looking at and asking about the love of the truth and as we look at these accounts of what happened, we are looking at, basically, we're trying to see how they did. You can tell that they loved the truth, and here's how you can see it. And that becomes, perhaps, a metric for us to use to tell when we take our own inventory. You know, study to show, um, or... Uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. When, when we take our own inventory of how we are doing, I think these are good ways, good examples of seeing and thinking about, is this what I see in my life? Is this what's happening with me? Um, no, not that you'll be doing miracles or, <laughs> or having prophecies uh, or kidnapped and taken to a foreign country, probably but that you will find yourself in the world as they found themselves in the world. In some sense, the displacement of the Judeans in Scripture is useful to us, maybe more so even than um, the, the uh, time when they were in the kingdoms and in their own land, when we're thinking in these terms, because that situation is a lot closer to the situation we are in. Not that we are in bondage or kidnapped in a foreign nation, but we are the children of God, and we, our citizenship is in heaven. And so, in any country where we are found, we are necessarily resident aliens. This world is not my home. I am just passing through. Our allegiance is to God first. And in this way, these displaced Judeans are very much like us. They are in another culture, in another society that has an entirely different structure and set of expectations for what is appropriate and what should be done. And yet they are governed by the law of God in their hearts and, and in their own personal actions in this world which is usually fine, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes the world doesn't like that, and sometimes doing what God wants you to do runs contrary to the culture where you find yourself situated, including our culture. So I think in a lot of ways, these are good examples if we're thinking about the topic, do I love the truth? Am, am I, you know, what did these do? who demonstrably love the truth. Do I demonstrate that love? One of the things that you can look at is a question uh, that you ask yourself. Does the next generation love the truth? And we don't mean by this that uh, fathers should be put to death for the sins of the sons, or that sons should be put to death for the sins of their fathers. We don't mean that. There is no inherited sin, original sin, anything of this nature. Nor yet is it the case that a parent who has a child who does not obey the gospel mean that it, that parent is not a good parent or a good faithful Christian. It doesn't mean that necessarily. Um, I would say it doesn't even mean that most of the time. Everybody obeys the gospel for themselves. Every generation obeys the gospel for themselves. God does not have grandchildren, just children. <laughs> um, our relationships to one another and in the flesh are incidental. We're all related to God directly. He is our Father. We are brothers and sisters. 
right? So when we ask, does the next generation love the truth? Well, what I mean by this is what is the environment that we are setting up? These are questions for some of us who are older and who have children. Not everybody has children. Not everybody is older. But I think you can understand the points that are being made. And if you are thinking about having children or you have them, but they're not old enough to make their own choices, these are certainly things to think about. Uh, the record shows that it is, you know, the last king of Judah, Jehoiakim. When Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon shows up and besieges Jerusalem and takes it. It is at that time, in the second verse of Daniel 1, that Nebuchadnezzar brings it all home to the land of Shinar, that is the plain in, in Babylon. Um, he's taking the captives, he's taking the uh, things that were made according to the law of Moses, the shovels, the pans, the snuffers, the candlesticks, the, all the things that are part of the temple and the worship of God, the vessels of gold. Nebuchadnezzar took those, put them in the treasury of his God, not the Lord, of course, and commanded a chief eunuch to bring some of the people of Israel of the royal family and of the nobility. Which ones? Well, specifically, the youths without blemish, of good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, and learning, competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. So the point of this is he is recruiting the youth corps for the assimilation of Judah. This is standard practice when you are uh, an imperialistic society. You take the people uh, by force, and then you take the young, the, the, the unformed, you know, high school, college age people, because, you know, they'll kind of do anything, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> you don't think so when you're that age. You're like, oh, what? I got my own body. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll talk about it. Come back in 10 years. But um, that's what you do. Standard, standard issue. You take them, you teach them, whatever, that, you know, there's only 11 years left of planet Earth, or whatever you want, and they'll believe it. it doesn't matter how cockamamie it is. This is the way, the reason why they grab that, and they go with that, and they teach them, and try to form them according to what they want in their culture. This is standard operating procedure. Rome would have done this. Babylon was quite successful, actually, one of the better. They were pretty good at it. And so this is the program. They bring these guys over. They're like, hey, you know, sorry about what happened back there. You weren't on the field. You didn't do this. You know, how about if you make things better for mom and dad at home? And make things better for the next generation. You know, Judah was nice, but look at what we have here. Look how far this reaches. You know, that's how it works. That's what they do. So, that being said... They're looking for the ones who are without blemish, good appearance, skillful in wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, and learning. What is this? Well, this is sales and marketing, right? These are the people that you want. You don't send, you know, people who are missing whatever, body parts or maimed in war or whatever. These are not the ones you send in there to try to push your pharmaceuticals at the doctor's office. You send the most beautiful or handsome fella you can find in the newest suit. That's how, you, how it works. It's the way of the world is what we're saying. All I'm getting at is, this is how the world is. Everybody gets this stuff imposed upon them by the world, whether they realize it or not. That's what we're saying, okay? Their purpose is to teach the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Or they're going to learn it, but their purpose is they're going to take it back home, too. And the Judeans are going to become Babylonians over the next generation. King assigned a daily portion of the food that he ate and the wine that he drank. They were to be educated three years, at the end of which time they were to stand before the king. 
And yes, three years. And uh, Greg Abbott starts to salivate. <laughs> they had him in and out in three years? Woo! Yeah, that's the idea, right? Among whom are Daniel, Hananiah, or that is Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, of the tribe of Judah. They all have the name Yahweh or the name God in their names. Okay, that is important. Spiritual things were important to their family. If I go back for a moment to the third verse, <clears throat> the chief eunuch is going to be in charge of this class, whatever, the recruits. And you may know, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself maybe, but these fellas stand out. They become the faithful. Um, Daniel, of course, chief among them, has the spirit of God to discern prophecy. Okay, but the other three are faithful men who stand up at the risk of their lives. That's what you're going to see happening here. But it starts early, and we're going to cover that part today, or at least this morning. But we're talking about the nation of Judah has been captive. They're selecting the candidates for this recruitment class. And in this class, we read about these four men who said that they wanted to eat kosher. That's what the first thing that happens is they want to eat kosher. They want to eat what is allowed by the law of Moses for them to eat. And you may know that in Babylon, they have never even heard of it, let alone do they care. So it's not a thing that's on the menu. <clears throat> and you know, our nation was, was like that for a long time, but anymore, if you're buying a plane ticket or you're going on a field trip or whatever, you know, they're going to ask if you need vegetarian or kosher or halal or things like that at this point. But as a rule, when things are in their prime and, and you know, everybody else is wrong and we have everything right, you kind of don't care what they eat or what they want to eat. You know, our food is good. You should like it. <laughs> That's Babylon's stance at this time. But there are these four fellows who said, now, can I do something different, please? And so what I'm asking here is, the people of Israel, the royal family, the nobility, shouldn't there be more than four souls in this number who want to keep the law of Moses? That's what the question. How big is this class? Well, we don't know, but you're talking about you took the entirety of Judah, whose numbers were at least six digits, if not seven at that time. What's it going to be, like a dozen guys? I think it's probably more like three or four hundred of them. But whatever. If you're pulling from the people, and you're pulling from the royal family and the nobility, how come there's only four of them who care about eating right, according to the law? This is a question that I ask in the context of, is the next generation righteous? Because it's telling. I understand that everybody makes their own choices, as said before. But what kind of environment 
you know, what kind of environment was being set? What kind of expectation, expectations were being set? What were they eating when they were in Judah and free? This is the point. Now that they've been displaced, now that they've been put into the world on their own, you know, like you and me when we go to work, for example, likely you are the only Christian at your place of work. Very likely, not always, but very likely that is the case. Or your place of school, you might be the only Christian in any given class, or maybe even in an entire school, I don't know. You're on your own. You have to make your choices. And the law is with you or the law is not with you. And what is that going to be? Are you going to do right even when other Christians are not around? When nobody, oh, no other Christian knows what choice you are making or have made or what you're being confronted with? As I said before, shouldn't there be? I mean, it doesn't say how many there are, but if they're intending to send to make these the ruling class of the next generation of Israel, there's got to be more than four or five of them. It's a pretty good number, right? How come there are only four that insist that they're going to keep the law of the Lord? This is, to me, an indication that the royal family, the nobility, the people in general... We're not doing what they should have been doing. We're not impressing on the next generation what they should have been impressing. I think they did make an impression, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately. That's what you're seeing, okay? In the aggregate. <clears throat> but again, what if you became incapacitated? What if we did become a resident alien under a foreign power? Uh, we don't have the same kind of restrictions in terms of food, clean and unclean. But, you know, cultures are, are different. Uh, if, you know, if some power from the Middle East, for example, were to gain control or you were to be found there, taken hostage, whatever, you would then be living in a culture where polygamy is the norm, for example. Uh, there'd be a lot of expectations of you that you could not fulfill and be right with God. Um, it's just an example. Not to say that these are bad places. There's a lot of things about that. Surprisingly, there's a lot of things about that that would actually be good for a Christian. Uh, the Quran actually carves out a space that Christians are always allowed to live in a Muslim country. They do have to pay a tax since they're not going to the mosque where everybody else pays in their tithe or whatever it is. The Christians are required to pay tax to the government to cover that expense for them. That's fine. Uh, but in exchange for this, they get to live there in peace and be part of this community, part of this country, and they're not molested or, or harmed. Uh, in theory, if you have one of the countries that actually listens to what's written there. <laughs> and they always say that our country is Christian, too. Don't forget. So, you know, sometimes, some places, right? But it couldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be all that bad, right? But there would be some expectations that you couldn't do. Even in the best of situations, they're going to have polygamy in a Muslim country. Um... Japan does the same. Uh, in China, you know, size of family is limited. That's okay. You're not required by God to have children. But in China, if you become pregnant, they require you to stop that by law. Something is going to happen, right? So there, there are things, is my point. There are cultures where... In every culture, as a Christian, if that becomes the reign, if that becomes the power, if you become subject to it, you are going to be tested. That's all we're getting at. Yeah, no, I don't have to eat kosher, which makes it a lot easier to get along when traveling. True. 
But there's a lot of other things that are a lot more serious that are pressures for us today. That's all that I'm getting at with this. Okay? So if you were to become incapacitated and you became a resident alien in some foreign place, what if all of us did? How would that go if they took our young men and our young women? Uh, we were incapacitated or prevented from, ha from having a say or having a rule, and we were put in the hands of the young, the children that we have raised, how's that going to go? Now, we were just joking about how little they know because they're so young. That's true. But there are some things they can know. What is it like if I'm in their hands and they get to call the shots and decide what is to be done? What are they going to decide? <laughs> yes, I can see the power going to Zach's head already. <laughs> But truly, I, actually, I would be fine with that because you're a Christian and a, and a good one. So I, I would be fine with that. I think that that would turn out okay. Or at least the best shot that we got at it. <laughs> but would we be in good hands if they took our young generation and made them the next ruling class? Would they ensure that we can worship acceptably, safely? These are metrics, that's all. If I'm thinking about whether or not the next generation loves the truth, I'm thinking about, yeah, how is my example, how is my emphasis, how is my teaching? Have we, in large part, done something about this. And you know, you don't have to have children to be concerned about the next generation. <laughs> We're all concerned about them. You don't have to have the children yourself. You can be that cool uncle or that favorite aunt. <laughs> uh, and anybody who does have children would be very happy for any Christian to offer to babysit or take them out to a movie, something like that. Okay. You can be an influence for good. You can also talk with them. And, you know, they'll say things to you when you're not mom or dad, when you're not authority figure. They'll say things to you they won't say to me, and that is okay. I like that because now there's something that I just don't have access to by reason of our relationship. But a Christian does, and that's good. And so we can work together, if you will, as a community of faith, so to speak, as the children of God and have an impact on the next generation as we should. Well, in this case, we get back to the text. The king, you know, the time comes, the king commands, bring them here, and the eunuch brought them in. The king spoke with them all, interviewing them, trying to figure out what's the deal here. Who's who? What's what? What do we got here? Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. They stood before the king. None was found like these. They excelled everybody else in that class. Is this because they are the smartest and the most handsome? No, it's because they are faithful. And God blessed them. In Daniel 1.20, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters already in the kingdom. Everything he had had so far wasn't as good. They're ten times better than all the wisdom that he had. That sounds like a parable. Hmm. Well, no, it literally happened, but I mean... <clears throat> sounds like a merchant of fine pearls in search and finds one that is of such a great value that he is very happy to sell all of his pearls in order to acquire that one. That's what it sounds like, isn't it? 
These are ten times better. These four. The rest of the class, I mean, you know, they're, they're good, but these are the ones. But why? It's because they're faithful. Okay, the episode we're talking about is between <laughs> these verses here. Not so much between the lines. Okay, But the next inventory question is, do I choose the good? Do I choose what is the good thing? Are those my choices, right? So the king's idea is, here is the food and the wine that I drink. Which, of course, is a great privilege. The king's food is the best. And the safest and cleanest. Okay, but it's the best. Um, that's a great privilege in any society. But Daniel resolved he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank either. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. The chief is in charge, you know, chief's been put in charge of all of these guys. This one guy, Daniel, says, I don't want to do this. He has resolved that he will not defile himself. I have already made up my mind. This is like, it's like Mark Powell says, Mark is here. Ah. I usually get to use this example and not not uh, embarrass you. But it's like Mark Powell says. People say, you're going to go to services tonight? He said, oh, I decided that 20 years ago when I obeyed the gospel. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Daniel resolved, I will not defile myself. And then he went to the chief of eunuchs to request that he not have to do this. Okay, so it starts first with resolve. Have you resolved? I am going to do what's right. There's a sense of, you know, if you look at it in this way, Daniel's not in a quandary necessarily. He's not scared necessarily. He just has a problem. I am resolved that I will do the will of the Lord, and it is contrary to my current set, set of instructions here. How can we change that? Well, first thing would be, don't hurt to ask. Let's go to the eunuch and see, can I just eat differently here? And the eunuch says, eh, basically, no. This is a special diet. You're supposed to make progress physically, and, you know, you need to look as good and be as strong and healthy and fit as everybody else in the class. If you don't, that's my head because I'm responsible for making sure that you progress, which is fair. But Daniel didn't give up. He came back with another idea. Okay, 11th verse. This eunuch is assigned over all four of the, the fellows. The, again, or all of them really, but these four are the ones who are saying we don't want to do this. The twelfth verse, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So here's the proposition. Ten day trial. Let us do it for ten days. We can recover from that. See what happens. You get to decide. You get to measure whether this is better or not. In, in your judgment, as you watch the progress of everybody, and as you have for many classes, and we respect you in the office that you're doing, and you do a good job of it, you come back and test us in 10 days and see if we're doing just as well as everybody else while eating kosher, basically. That's a reasonable proposition. But to have that temerity, I guess, to go forward... Um, or maybe not, the boldness to go forward. You know, you, at first you ask, and they say no for reasons. Then you go back again and say, how about this? 
It's always a deal. You're making a deal. You're negotiating. Why? Because you won't be deterred. You won't give up. That's all. All right, let's do it this way. How about this? I understand your concerns and your reasons, and that makes sense. Here's how we can bring the two together. 10-day trial. You decide at the end of the trial. We Matter is over. Why can he say you decide at the end of the trial? <laughs> then let our appearance be compared to that of the others who eat the king's food and deal with your servants according to what you see. Why can you do that confidently? Because, well, he can do that confidently because the confidence is not in himself. It's in God. He's confident that God's way is the best way, and it will turn out for the best. So again, do I love truth? Do I really love truth like these guys love truth? He listened to them in this matter and did the test, the 10-day trial. He listened to them. You say, well, they don't listen to me. But did you say anything? Well, I asked, and they said no. Did you come back with a counteroffer, a solution to the reasons why they said no? Well, well, what? Why is that stopping you? Why are you being stopped from doing God's will? Why do you let anything get in the way? Why did you give up? Don't. You say, well, it makes me uncomfortable. Well, you know what's uncomfortable? Hell is uncomfortable. Forget that mess. You need to be serious about serving the Lord. Yeah, they may not like it. Eh. A lot of people don't like a lot of things. You're not doing anything wrong. You're doing the will of the Lord and you won't be stopped. He is resolved. And this guy listened. And at the end of ten days, it was seen. Indeed. These four were better in appearance, fatter in flesh, than everybody else who ate the king's food. Not only did they keep up, they excelled. They did better. And again, you and I are not concerned about kosher eating. I get it. Um, but, you know, you do work or you do learn in school, whatever it is, you have somebody that you report to. Anybody who is a manager, um, who is a leader, who is a supervisor, you know, who has authority over others, a teacher, is very happy when a faithful Christian reports to them. Because you can deal honestly. You deal forthrightly. You're not intimidated to do the wrong thing. Right? They love that. They love you because of your principle. They can confide, confide in you. They can talk to you. You will be uh, thoughtful, shrewd, appropriate, trustworthy. This is good, and it should be good. Being a Christian is great. It is the best thing you can possibly be, and it's good for any organization that has any sense in it. So yes, they did better. And yes, the steward took away their food <laughs> and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. So what does that look like? Well, this is like, you know, this is like the carts at dim sum, right? <laughs> what is he rolling away? He's rolling away the sterling platter of, you know, barbecue pork ribs, right? And steamed oysters, and skewers uh, of, uh, of uh, sea scallops and shrimp, and bringing over the plate of vegetables. And there are people who will say, yay, but don't do it. Okay. <laughs> but it is a yay. That's my point. This is a victory. You're thinking to yourself, hey, man, the king's delicacies look pretty good. I would think that I would like to have that. I would take the opportunity. 
you know, to indulge in these things. Hey, when did Rome do as the Romans? That's how people are. That's why, you know, that's why New Orleans exists and Las Vegas exists. <laughs> and cabarets in France exist because, hey, when did Rome do as the Romans? But that's wrong. God is everywhere. God sees everything. You would think, yeah, the king's delicacies, that's what I want. Not God's clean food. Uh, well, God's clean food allowed them to eat other things, but not in Babylon. You don't know what that is. You don't know what's been done to it. It's not safe. This is the basis of Romans 14, by the way. Where it says the one who is weak eats only vegetables. It means he's, he's weak by position. He's compromised. Like these guys are. They're not at home where they have priests to bless the meat. They offer something that they know is clean and is the first, uh, the firstborn, or yeah, is the first of the flock and has been approved by inspection by the priests that it is sacred or it is acceptable in the law of God to consume this. They don't have that, so they got to go with just vegetables because they can't trust any of the meat. That's Romans fourteen, man. That's all it is. But you see, this is a victory. They won. Yeah, they don't have the, the king's delicacies on their plate right now, but they have God's favor. And they have, you know, the esteem of the steward. And again, the way that it ended, remember, they ate vegetables for the Lord. For the years that they were there in this training. And at the end of that, they brought them all out. And remember Daniel 1.19? None was found like these. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Which is why they stood before the king. They got appointed to the king's cabinet over and above all the other Judean uh, captives who had finished the schooling. These four. Why? Well, because they were faithful. Did Nebuchadnezzar know that? No, he doesn't know that. That's not important. God knows that. And God who sees in secret will reward you openly. Things will go better for you. You live the Christian life. You stand up for God. You stand up for what's right. You resolve and, and you don't be deterred. Don't allow things to deter you. God will bless you. That's the meaning. Do I love the truth? Well, there's a lot more to talk about, but we're out of time. For now, that's enough to think about, I think. Again, shouldn't there have been more than four of them? Yeah, there should have been more than four of them. But you know, we have a better covenant. We have better promises. We have a better Savior. And there's more than four of us. A lot more than four of us. There's more than eight of us. Compare Noah and his crew. And we're out there in the world. We're living, working, schooling. You know, so take that resolve with you. Love the truth more than anything else, and God will bless you. Won't always be easy. People don't always like it. Things happen, like getting thrown in furnaces and stuff like that, you know. But, hey, it happens. Being right with God is the important thing. We'll get to them being thrown in a furnace in Daniel. They're going to be saved, okay? I'm just joking a little, because, you know, in the end, they're not going to die. But you might. The important thing about that episode, by the way, just as a little sneak preview, is when they say, but if not. <laughs> you ever stop and notice that? Say, King, we don't need to answer. You know, our God is able to deliver us from that fire. But if not, we're, we're still not going to bow. I love the but if not. Like, he might, he might not, but, you know, we're still going to do the right thing. I think that's true. Not to be too flippant about it, but that that really is true. Like, 
He is able to deliver, deliver me. He has delivered me many times already. There will come a time when he doesn't, as the doctor told me. There will be a day I can't help you. And I said, you're retiring. He said, you're going to die. I said, oh, right, yes, you're right. <laughs> one of them will be the last one. Fair enough. But as a rule, in life, as you live, your confidence is well-placed. And God will deliver you. All right. If you are not a Christian, become a Christian. And these blessings and more can be yours. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Become a Christian by repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus as the Christ, be buried together with him in baptism, putting to death the old person of sin, that you might be resurrected a new person in Christ Jesus. The old things are gone, all has become new. An old preacher told a story he used to drink, and he, and he walked by the bar after having obeyed the gospel later. He walked by the bar and they called to him, Hey, hey, why don't you come here no more? And he said, Oh, I... I never did that. And they said, yes, you did. You came here all the time. He said, no, sir, that man's dead. I've never been there. And that's true. He was a Christian. You started over. And you can start over. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, confess him. Put him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins. Be resurrected together with him and look forward to heaven with God, no matter what happens here. I hope that you have blessing after blessing and live a very long life. That's not guaranteed, but salvation in heaven is. If today we can help you with our prayers as a Christian, we're glad to pray for you too. If you need our prayers, need to be baptized, let your need be known while we stand and sing.